From the Fathead Studio in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Man, am I still pretty? And he's like, you ain't pretty, but you're going to be all right. Now I'm just hanging on, looking at the wall, like flying this way. I'm like, oh, man, I got to let go of this thing at some point. And then there's one that could literally pick you up. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, I'm not really sure about that, but yeah. That's called a helicopter. Well, <laughs> and the last lap was just chaos. I mean, like four wide, five wide. It's like, whatever. If you land it and send it into the fence, you're probably not going to get hurt. Bounce and then this insane roll, the car that Keegan was in. I mean, it. I don't know if it's the shape of the Beetle or what, but that thing sent it. So I was a supercharger specialist on my uh, old man's car. With specialist? Robert. Yeah, it sounds cooler than crew guy. <laughs> <laughs> I am Tony Stewart. I'm Mario Andretti. I'm Christy Lee. I'm Alexander Rossi. I'm Cruz Pedregon. What's up? I'm Kyle Duke, and this is The Skinny. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny. We're at Fathead's Eyewear Studios here in Speedway, Indiana, just down the street from Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We have a great show coming your way here today. I'm Ken Stout, Rico Elmore, sitting alongside here at the V-Desk, and, of course, behind the controls, once again, the track dude, Michael Young. One Mr. Kyle LaDuke has joined us from L.A. That's lower Alabama now. <laughs> Used to be in Southern California, but now you're in Alabama. And I know you made the move there a few years ago, and... How are you liking it, by the way, now that you're settled in there? I know you kind of built your own track. You built a little track for your son as well, and uh, all settled in. I'm looking at that room behind you. It looks like you finally gotten moved in because it takes a few years to get it all done. Yeah, you uh, you call on a day where it's 91 degrees outside and it feels like 105. So um, <laughs> it is Alabama summers, and it gets humid, it gets hot. But um, no, it's good. It's It's really nice neighborhoods nice people nice environment just uh a, a, a big chunk of freedom for sure moving here and uh fortunately we we're able to find <clears throat> 30 plus acres and yeah like you said i first thing i did was i rented a d5 dozer and <laughs> started pushing dirt and <laughs> built a moto track and uh slash utv track uh, trophy car like everything that you could imagine i want to i've tested the pro 4 on it just uh, a little playground over on the side, you know. When I talked to Amber, I'm like, I really want to build a track here somewhere. I don't know how we're going to do it with all these trees and stuff. And she's like, just go. Like, just build it. We've got plenty of room. Don't hesitate. She's not going to tell me no. It's uh, it's something we've all worked hard for, to move out of Cali, move our family, make big decisions. And um, it was a million percent worth it. Um, the only thing we had to do was put a pool in because summers are gnarly here for sure. So, uh, Kyle, we were, we were just talking about when, before we had you on. What I'm familiar with the Birmingham area. Obviously, I work a little bit with IndyCar. And if I, we were just having this discussion this past weekend. If I had any place to move with the exception of where I live now, Birmingham would be my spot. And it's just interesting that you got down in that area of Alabama. And to your point, it's just a whole other way of living down there. The people are so great. And that you found that to be home. I, I just I, I share that your same love for that area of the country. It is amazing down there. The heat's a little hot in the summertime, but other than that, it is it's just something else. Yeah, but it, okay. So yes, it does get hot, but it's not as hot as Arizona. And there's water. I can literally drive down our street about a mile and a half and put our boat in the water. The kids can go to the beach. Uh, there's water here, so it's it's nothing to complain about. Obviously. The summers don't the winters don't get freezing we don't get snow so i can be outside in december when the people in wisconsin are fishing in a hole in the lake so i don't uh i don't i don't complain about the heat because i enjoy the other side of it so no it's been good it's been uh it's been different for sure um but the cool thing is everybody knows i wouldn't say everybody but a lot of people surprisingly know me and off-road racing like Oh, I went really? to, oh, dude, obviously there's dirt track racing. There's a place called Deep South Speedway, not too far from here. So there's racing everywhere. But um, I went to go, me and Emma went to go look at a boat. I've never priced out a boat. I was like, man, it'd be cool to get a boat. You know, maybe we move here, get the kids on a boat. The guy gave me a whole tour of the place, whatever. And he's like, yeah, you know, yeah, we got boats, whatever. He's like, what's your name? I'll take down your information. He's leaning against the wall. And he's like, I said, Kyle. Okay. Yeah. How do you spell your last name? L-E-D-U-C. All right. Oh. That's like the uh, short course off of a racing family. That's pretty cool. 
He turns around and he's like, son of a bitch, it's Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, dude, I used to watch all the Lucas Oil races. You were running center. Oh, my God. We were taking self. The price of the boat went down drastically. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Perfect timing. And his brother races dirt track. And I was, I was just blown away that just telling him my name, he instantly just built this whole, oh, man, I followed off-road racing for decades, man. You know, like. It's 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 crazy to think about for sure to be just in a random new spot and, and somebody know what we're doing. Super, super cool, man. Hey, we're going to take yeah. a quick break. When we come back, we'll focus in on some of the numbers that this guy racked up. They are nothing short of amazing. When you go to a race and he blows his engine or he has a huge crash with Johnny Green and he's pissed off and you literally got to load that thing up and start driving right now, you're like, oh, my God, this trip is going to suck. The Skinny is brought to you by Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. And American Coach, innovation is our life force. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny. I'm Ken Stout. Rico sitting alongside. We have one Mr. Kyle LaDuke on the show with us. And for many years, whenever he first started racing, everybody would refer to him as the son of Kurt LaDuke, legendary Kurt LaDuke, who's done just about everything you could do inside of an off-road car, including Paris to Dakar and, of course, Baja and a lot of short course racing. Kyle came on. I've known Kyle since he, since 2002, I believe it was, which is when I started my short course off-road career. He started his short course off-road career and then had the fortunate uh, opportunity to line up beside him inside of a pro light truck. First race ever at Cran, and he looked over at me. I think you were, in, you were in the second row because you missed a driver's meeting or something because you should have been in the front row. I was in the <laughs> second row because I was a rookie first time ever, but I remember him looking at me. He said, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> I had something to say back, but of course it didn't work out my way. <laughs> and they threw the green flag and he took off and I never saw him again. So <laughs> just the way it went. But man, I can't believe we've known each other for, for 20 years. And uh, I, I teased yeah. some of your accomplishments um, before we went to break, but eight short course championships, seven of those in Pro 4, of course, at the highest level. That first one coming in Pro Light, by the way, and uh, a number of wins there, I think 17 wins there in that division. Eight big cup wins, Challenge Cup wins, Potawatomi Cup wins. I mean, the biggest races in short course racing of all time, and you got it done, dude. I mean, and, and I think it's very important for the fans at home to know that it was from tough love. Dad didn't build you or <laughs> give you anything. Everything you have, you earned and fought for. Yeah, I mean, obviously, he, he gave us a, a shop to do it out of and a, a, a stern fist to get it done. But um, prior to us even putting on helmets, um we worked for the guy. I mean, we worked in the shop. We were, we were kids, but we were just employees. And, and that almost kind of sucked worse than just being an employee. But, um, <laughs> it was, it was just, uh, he, I guess he taught us now that I'm older, obviously. Right. You know, I'm not Kyle, the kid anymore, like you used to call me, but the, uh, the direction, the guidance to be able to realize that my dad was doing this for a living, right? Like, the stuff that we got as kids and growing up, even the food, the house, he was doing it by one, building trucks, and two, going out and racing them. Um, so knowing that that could even be done was 90% of the battle, honestly. Looking at it now, like educating my my 10-year-old son, like, dude, Reed, you can get sponsors and you can save money. We're saving money for you when you're older. And, um, you know, we raced mountain bikes growing up up here on this... Uh, trophy up here on the Lucas right there that bicycle um that is the very first trophy I've ever received in 1994 and and I keep it it's right there on one of my biggest you know trophies here in the shop because that's like the 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 carrot dangling at the end of the stick like that was you get they give you these if you do really good and <laughs> it was uh it was motivating to you know for one to to get checks and to win races but two I mean, to get these trophies back here, the other side, the uh, the cup races, you name it, you start rambling off all these wins. It was, it was gnarly. It was, it was a roller coaster. And obviously I sit back and reflect on it and uh, I'm going to work my ass off to make a lot more of those things. 
and build a second step to that trophy rack and build them over here and try and uh, try and add add to the add to the love. I mean, there's hundred uh, hundred over hundreds of wins, and each one of them is is as exciting almost as the first one when you're jumping up on your roof in 2003 at Crandon and winning the world championships. I remember it because it was a huge deal for me being a punk kid driving a little pro light truck, passing Chad Hort, beating Jeff Kincaid, racing Rick Huseman and winning. And uh, it just it just motivated me be, beyond what I thought I could be motivated uh, to one, do it and, and, and two, make a living at doing it. Kyle, you talked about the inspiration, what your dad, obviously you're working for him. And it's always tough when you work with your father to, to try to separate the tough love and what he's trying to teach you. But what was the one thing that he taught you most that, that you, when you look back, you maybe thought, well, that's not really that important dad. And that's not something I'll ever need to know. And then of course, fatherly advice always proves to be the best. Well, we definitely had some knockdown drag out fights. I mean, Ken knows my dad. I know my dad. A lot of people know my dad and it's, it's a tough road deal with that guy, um, but I guess I guess the way to look at it is he means well. It's if he's calling you an idiot, it's because you've done something really stupid, <laughs> and he's not saying it because you're an idiot. He's he's telling you that because, dude, like just what are you doing? Like you're you've, you're, you've you're been you're, an idiot, right? Yeah, he doesn't yeah, want you to do it again. Is what he's trying to say. <laughs> Yeah, but without without smacking you or without, you know, telling you you're stupid, just like, dude, that was that was stupid. So I think the biggest thing that he did for me was give me some freedom. Uh, me and him were so head to head on like building my first truck kind of into my second truck. He was inch by inch, you know, do this, do this, do this, this is what it is. And I didn't know enough to be able to argue that fact. Um, but five or six years into it, I started figuring out what I liked, what um, aesthetically looked right. I worked on my own truck. So if he says, oh, we need to put some tubes here. No, dude, I, I can't put tubes there. I got to pull my transmission out by myself because I don't have a crew chief. So I need to be able to work on it differently than you do. <laughs> so we would butt heads and it, there was a certain point where he's like, all right, you know, do this. We worked on a class eight together. He kind of gave me some freedom to you know, design some of the chassis and um, play with tin work and, and look at cooling. And once I started doing that, I started creating cars that were to me and to some other people have told me before that were superior, superior than one that I had before. And then, and then two superior than the rest of the field. So that really motivated me to think like, all right, what else is possible? What can I do? How cool can I make this car look? Because you want it to go fast. You want it to do good. But also you want people to be like, whoa, that truck looks sick, right? Like that's part of the thrill of being in the grandstands is seeing cool race cars. So he gave me the freedom to be able to build uh, kind of whatever I wanted. I mean, I was in his shop and, and some days I'd get out there at 10 o'clock where the guys all started work at seven or eight. And, uh, you know, he'd yell at me for showing up late, but they would all leave and go home to their families at five. And I'd be working there until 10, 11 o'clock at night. And he'd have to run out and turn off the air compressor because it was loud. He couldn't go to sleep. And uh, I was just off the <laughs> building and tinkering and, and loving it. So uh, he motivated me. He also shut me down a lot, but none of it was uh, none of it deterred me from wanting to continue on and and, and keep getting better. So. Whatever he did to me, it worked. Um, did it suck half the time? Of course. I mean, you're battling with your dad. You're arguing. It's it's a nightmare. Um, I mean, we did road trips across the country and semis together. Like, you know, road trips, right? It's family road trips. Yeah, it's great. There's but no, there's no getting trucks, away. <laughs> when you go to a race and he blows his engine or he has a huge crash with Johnny Greaves and he's pissed off and you literally got to load that thing up and start driving right now. You're like, Oh my God, this trip is going to suck. He's going to be so <laughs> mad. All the time. And then you like Todd would grind the shifter on the semi. My dad would wake up and knock the curtain out. Cause we didn't have a big toter on. We just literally had a tractor. So the kids would be up driving during the night. He'd be driving during the day, sleeping at night. Like, yeah, it was, uh, it was a rodeo for sure. It would have been a great uh, TV show back in the day. 
<laughs> he just brought up his brother. Uh, yeah, it wasn't just his dad that he was battling with. He and his brother had their fair share of moments as well. We'll touch on that when we come back. I'd probably be at 300 wins if it wasn't for that guy because he stole a fair share of wins and, and me and him had it out every, every day on the track. You are looking at Kyle LaDuke, one of the best of all time to compete in short course off-road racing. The numbers are staggering. As he mentioned before, over 100 career wins, eight championships. You went for a rip when you won six championships in a span of seven years and 50 wins over the course of those seven years. Dude, I got goosebumps saying it. <laughs> it was an unbelievable rip there. Uh, and that, that was from 2014 to 2020. This isn't like it was a long time ago, man. I mean, you were getting it done yeah, against yeah. the absolute best. <laughs> yeah, and, and I almost remember every lap of it. Um, that's, that's the cool and crazy part of it is I started in 2000, uh, 2008 season with Pro 4 and uh, built the Pro 4 on a whim. I wanted to go race Pro 4. I had a contract to race Pro Light. I was like, man, I really want to race Pro 4. Um, so we started building it. My dad went to Dakar and did a couple races, and he was gone from the shop for about a month and a half. And when he came back, there was almost a rolling chassis in the shop. Um, and uh, at the time, we are with a different energy drink company, and they uh, they came to me and like, all right, yeah, we can probably put something together. I'm like, cool. He's like, when do you think you can get up a truck? I'm like, three weeks. <laughs> It's almost done already. I just went. <laughs> so it's just because I knew I wanted to be there, man. I had spotted for my dad for a decade. I, you know, I had fun in Pro Light. I didn't really want to go to Pro Two. Todd was doing great in Pro Two. Uh, sponsors weren't needing me to go to Pro Two or wanting anything different. So I was like, man, Pro Four is obviously the pinnacle. You're looking at, you know, obviously you remember back then the field was stacked, dude, twenty some odd trucks. I was like, man, I really want to be there. So oh eight, I got in the class. That very first year, that's when uh, core uh, collapsed, and I was able to win three races uh, in my first season. And I was I was blown away that I was even competitive, or my name was even going to be said. So to do that in the first year was big. And then obviously I had my homeboy Rick Huseman to battle with. So he, uh, I'd probably be at 300 wins if it wasn't for that guy, because he stole a fair share of wins, and and me and him had it out every <laughs> every day on the track. And uh, you know, between me, him, and Renazetter, I don't, I don't know of many other people there for a five to six year span that won races. I mean, we were all, you know, at the top of our game, really pushing the limits with the trucks. You know, Danny and his brother came out with killer trucks. Bill Smith and Renazetter made trucks, and I was just, I literally was a dude in a shop building a truck. I didn't, I'm not an engineer by any means. Um, we built a good truck. That was my first truck that I raced with, and. Uh, I started building Stilo, my Pro 4, a kind of a dream truck just to tinker with. And I didn't get it done. And I was like, well, maybe we can thrash and get it done and get it for the first race of 14. And uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And it got like within a month to the race. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do this. We got to pull the, we got to pull the trigger on the old truck, pull the motor out of the new truck and the gearbox, put it in, in the old Pro 4. And we went out and that was the start of it that was the start of the year of of when it all just worked we tuned the truck we i took risk as drivers as a driver and kevin huseman helped me a ton with driving um and uh that's when we won a good 11 in a row or 10 in a row it was something something stupid um and a championship and then i brought out Steele the next year i raced that truck for two years <clears throat> and won two championships with a back-to-back, -back, all the cup races, I'm pretty sure, and like 25, 24 stupid wins in two seasons. And that's, I think I didn't win four, maybe five. Like that was, that was the couple of years where I was like, dude, what are we doing and how are we doing it so damn good? Because obviously, you know, it's, it's the driving, it's, it's the truck, it's the performance, it's the prep, like something's got to go wrong. And I remember you talking on TV, doing the announcing going, and that looks like win number 11 or 13 in a row for Kyle. <laughs> and I just would pause it and go dude, what? Like, 
dozens like i don't know it was it was uh it was crazy to to live it and to be a part of it and then uh you know we've won some some races for sure since then but that truck that package that we had in the old pro four and the stilo truck it was i feel it was ahead of the rest of the field it was a specifically built truck for the manual gearbox super low cg really clean lines the thing hauled ass and uh and we broke a lot of hearts racing that truck and i think that was uh that was a good time to be on the team part of the program part of the family it was it was just uh we couldn't do anything wrong you know it was crazy I said but that's sketchy buddy like uh going to elsinore <laughs> hairpin 180 at 80 and go backwards i'm like that's sketchy dude Welcome back to The Skinny. We have Kyle Duke on the show with us here this week. And you just touched on it um, inadvertently. I felt like it was a period of time of change and growth inside of that Pro 4 class. The way you were driving the truck became different. The, what you, I think you, you really touched on it in the previous segment when you were building trucks, how you wanted the truck to be. So you started learning your craft. You started adjusting the truck to accommodate the way you wanted that thing to, to turn and the pro fours are tough to turn. I know you guys have a lot of technology in the front diff to, to disengage it, engage it. But the fact that that's when you really started backing the trucks in because you have to rotate those trucks and then you want to get to full throttle and have all four tires digging. So the, the, uh, the big accomplishment was trying to figure out some way to get those trucks to rotate as hard as you rotate them because they weren't really doing that before that time. They, you guys were sneaking up on it. Right. But, boy, once once the light bulb went off, man, I mean, you guys were slinging them in hard. Yeah, and I remember talking with Kevin because Kevin Huseman, you know, after his brother passed away and his brother has passed away, I wanted to keep them in, in racing. They were just awesome people and great friends, and we grew up hanging out together. So they were going to the track, and, you know, I – let him take his time and you know we we got on the radio and started talking together and you know he's like all right you know rick would do this and i i i push him to try and do this but i feel like the truck can do this and he was really really smart on the outside so i trusted his visual on the outside right so he's like man you're getting so much drag coming into these corners and i would fight rick with that too as the back is dragging <clears throat> as well as the front and you put steering in and it gets sketchy so he's like, if, if, if you could push the limits further, then I think it would really free up the car. And I said, yeah, I said, <laughs> I said, but that's sketchy, buddy. Like, uh, go into Elsinore <laughs> hairpin 180 at 80 and go backwards. I'm like, that's sketchy, dude. He's like, I know, but you're, you're going to like it. You're going to feel it. And, uh, it took me, it took me a couple weekends, but it would get to the point where we go over that Matterhorn in the back and the truck would land and set and you would as the truck would set, you kind of flick it a little bit on the takeoff so that you're kind of the wrong way, pointed the wrong way. And when you would land, I'd put a bunch of input in to the wheel. And then as soon as that would happen, I'd be off the gas rotating and dude, it would just go so easily and so freely and so quickly that there was no time for resistance. Um, there was no time for the drag. And it took me some over rotations and you've seen it all. We're in the infield driving over the tires and over committing uh but that was just feeling those boundaries and once i got that it was like dude you can't you can't outbreak me because i don't use the brakes right so you can't outbreak me going into these corners and then when you're there you're worried about hooking a rut and flipping over i'm not anymore and and you know i watched bill smith and renaissance Center build these upside down four links and and you know the heart and hunting teams you remember all these guys and they came with all these mechanisms to make it do that. And the biggest mechanism was just commitment, right? Like landing with the wheels turn, uh, you can't just do it on a normal car. So you have to build the steering stronger. You have to build these pumps stronger, the belt systems. You have to build all that so that you can say, hey, dude, I need to land with the wheels turn. And they're going to go, there's no way. And I said, yeah, yeah, but I have to. So what's next, right? Um, <laughs> And that Stilo truck really, when that truck was loaded and it would land and you'd put input in, man, I, I could, I could do three sixties if I wanted to, because you're not going down a straightaway and just turning the tires. That tire weighs 900 pounds. When I land with the wheels cranked, that tire weighs 4,000 pounds and it is grabbing the dirt and it's making me go that way. And the ass is, can't keep up and it just wrap. 
So again, a lot of that happens and uh, there's downshifting involved because I went from a two speed automatic to a six speed sequential. And once that happened, dude, I, I fell in love with the truck. The power band was there. Every gear shift, it could get you out of trouble. If you start seeing the big rut coming through a corner, you just drop a gear and raise the RPMs up and it would just blast through it with the right rear. And it just, uh, once I got brave, then I was like, all right, how do we, how do we use this to our advantage? And uh, it just went from one turn to the next, going up jumps. There was jumps where we were floating sideways at Elsinore. Like we started doing that that 14, 15, and 16 year span. We started doing some stupid stuff with the Pro Force, and uh, I I I would agree that it, it changed the game. It wasn't just me. I mean, Carl drove that way. We started pushing the limits for sure. But um, every time we went on the track, it was like we need to push in a very different way. Um, and it, it paid off more than I could ever imagine it would have. <laughs> Just a couple kids BS in the pits, like, dude, you need to start throwing that truck around. It's like, all right, man, we're either going to uh, be up late tonight or we're going to win some damn races. And uh, <laughs> we won some races. You won some races. Excellent yeah. stuff, man. Some great insight from one of the best to ever sit behind the wheel of a Pro 4 for sure. Well, he's taken a year off from racing, but that doesn't mean he's not still fighting. We'll touch on that when we come back. I didn't hesitate on any of it. A lot of it was questionable. Should I do this? Should I do that? I said, I don't care. I need to live. This kitty is brought to you by American Coach. American Coach, innovation is our life force. And Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. Welcome back to The Skinny. We're here in Speedway, Indiana. This is the Fatheads Eyewear Studios. We have Kyle LaDuke with us here on the show. I'm Ken Stout. Rico Elmore sitting alongside and the track dude. We're going to touch on a pretty serious subject here. And as you can uh, see here on camera, that Kyle may look a bit different than the last time you saw him. We've had a number of conversations. I'm wearing the shirt that uh, uh, certainly supports him as well and, and proud to do so. Just wish... It wasn't going on. The glass in front of me, there's a website where you can support him as well. Um, Duke 99 Strong. I, um, it, it, we just got to hit it in the head here. I don't know any other way to do it. I know that's how you are as well, Kyle. Uh, you're battling cancer, my friend, and uh, so sorry to say that, but you're a tough, tough cat, and I know this has been going on since last October. You've learned a ton. And instead of running from it and hiding from it, I know you're a, you're a hit it head on type of guy. And I really feel like we have the opportunity here to help some other people along the way. I felt so blessed and able to to connect you with a couple of people that I think you know gave you some good information and was able to help you out. And uh, and I know you want to pass that along as well. So tell us about what's going on, man. How you uh, how you figured out you had this and. I know your lifestyle and your diet has changed dramatically. Give us an idea of what's going on and the best way to approach something like this. Yeah, I mean, there's I, we could sit here for a couple hours and, and, and talk about this stuff, but it's uh, I I know I'm not the only one, right? And that's that's the crazy part. It's it's not one and me or five of the people. There's millions and millions of people that are in the same boat as I am. Um, so you know i don't i don't i don't know i guess i don't know how to say the part about we're all in this together i guess is the word that you want to say the way you want to feel because some people some people have tough times with it i mean everybody's body's different um everybody's mental strength is different everybody's family situations are different financial so uh you know fortunately last year um i had some swollen glands on the side of my neck I went into the doctors to uh, just get them looked at. I should have went maybe a month sooner than I did, um, but it wouldn't change anything. So I went in there and had a uh, tested and they, they saw cancer cells in there and were worried that it could have been lymphoma or something like that. So then it wasn't, so then they had to look at some scans. So then we had to start getting scanned and, and see where this was coming from. And uh, they found a big tumor up in my whole face here um, and your sinus cavity back in the back. And it was starting to protrude out into my, my nose. It started pushing up into my eyes. So this eye was really swollen and watering. I couldn't hear out of the side. I basically had a tennis ball, softball, stupid thing. It was, it was bad. Um, 
so it was rough there for a minute and and we needed to get on chemo quickly and that chemo needed to work so of course the i don't know i've heard this a million times the cancer you have is one of the most rare forms we've ever seen um and one of the most aggressive right literally the worst too and you're a stage four it's in your bones it's in your face it's in your body like you couldn't have been told a, a worst case scenario for, for sure. Uh, and that was tough for a couple of days to spread the word. I guess the, the biggest part was having to tell people that you were sick. Um, it's tough to hear that people are sick, but to have to tell people, eh, it's a whole different game. And uh, that was that was tough for a couple of days. And I, I, you know, we cried. We had our emotions, the family, the friends, the team, all of that, sponsors, you name it, we all had discussions. And uh, once the word got out, once we talked about it, that was that was like, all right, cool, that's done. Like, right, like the, the, the emotional side of it's done. Now it's time to get uh, to get to work. And um, I didn't hesitate on any of it. A lot of it was questionable. Should I do this? Should I do that? I said, I don't care. I need to live. So I've got a wife, I've got two kids. I want to hang out for a little while. Um, so it was tough, you know, to grit your teeth and just be like, all right, go put this poison in me and, and hope it works. Uh, we had some great foundations helping. Ganassi helped a ton with education and, and directing us with doctors. And we started getting treatment right away and it was it was working. Um, you know, the swelling went down, the, the, all the scans were showing really good on my face. Um, and we just started buttoning down. I mean, it's, it's chemotherapy every three weeks. You get a week of crap. You're a, you're an absolute wreck. You don't have any power. You don't have any energy. And then you got to go for a couple weeks and then you got to go back into the same place that you know is going to knock you down. And that's really tough. Um, but it's just, uh, wrapping your mind around the situation and, and accepting the situation, whether it be good, bad, or ugly. Um, and just going to work, like you said, it's it's not that I'm uh, hard headed or 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 you know don't take it as bad as it is. I just uh, I'm not I don't I don't care for it to beat me. Um, there's no elements of us to sit there and allow it to fuel me. You know when when I'm putting chemo in me or, or changing my diet or, or taking these piles of, of supplements. Uh, when I take them, I tell myself they're working, go to work, get to it. I can't do the work. I physically can't sit here and go kill cancer, but I can educate myself. My wife has done 99% of the effort to do that, educating ourselves, our family and talking with people. And, um, we're, we're going all in. I mean, as I'm giving her everything I have, the, the, the organizations have helped and raised funds for me uh, beyond what I could imagine. And those funds aren't, um, you know, for living, for for boats, for fun stuff or all that stuff. It's for me being able to go out of the country to be able to um, do alternative treatments. So fortunately, my sponsors have all been amazing. Um, the families here, we have, you know, a, a, a great support system here. And so we're okay. But the funding and the, and the benefit stuff that my dad is, you know, spearheaded and helped out a ton and all these tracks and people that is to just be able to just not have boundaries and say, you know what, we need to find any I have places in Mexico, we've potentially looked in Germany, there's places all over the world that we're trying to find to uh, fight this to put the best effort forward, and say we gave it our all and it worked. So a lot of education. I know I'm kind of rambling on and on here, but it's uh, it's been a, a lot to take in. And I've had some great friends that have shoved a ton of information down my throat. And sometimes I've rejected them and been a pain in the ass. But it's just, uh, I appreciate every inch of it. It's just been a, a lot to, to turn your world off of racing for decades. You see it all behind me, decades. And, and just go, hey, how do I survive? I, I don't know anything about myself. <laughs> you know, for the most part, we're not doctors. So I, I, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to switch gears, but we're doing it. We're happy. We're okay. And, uh, the process is working. 
I feel fine. I looked scrawny. That's why your show is called the Skinny. Um, <laughs> Playing on word with two fat guys. Yeah. All right, make it easy. <laughs> Welcome back to The Skinny. We have Kyle O'Duke on the show with us here this week. Certainly uh, glad he could take the time and, and find the effort to spend it with us. Of course, phenomenal in his racing career. He's taken a year off as he's battling what's known as head and neck cancer, and we had a chance to talk to him about that a bit last segment. Uh, we'll touch on this just a little bit more because, again, I think it's very helpful to somebody out there. If we help one other person out there, I, I think it's worth the time uh, for sure. Unfortunately, there's way more than one. But uh, I know one of the things that you told me that uh, you're doing that has really helped immensely, and help me if I'm wrong here, but I think you called it an alkaline diet. Uh, but your diet alone has changed significantly in how you approach it and everything you said, Amber, your wife, of course, has been so supportive in helping out with. Yeah, I think the biggest thing right away, she, she obviously she knew something was going on and she knew it wasn't going to be right. Um, so once we obviously figured out what it was and how to fight it, she, uh, did a lot of research and, and just racked her brain while I kind of wrapped my brain about around what's going to happen with everything and how we logistically figure out life. And, um, so yeah, she came up upon this, uh, this guy, Dr. Sebi, um, ancient guy, old, old school guy, um, and his diet and his alkaline diet and food and water and, and just, just stop feeding a way to stop feeding cancer um obviously you know cancer feeds off of of glucose and sugars and and things like that so um i was you know i was a, a candy fiend a sweet uh sweets guy i would you know always always guilty of that not that that's what caused any of this but um if i could eliminate that um then we needed to and and everyone says you know oh it's so hard to to stop drinking soda or like to stop eating out or like whatever. But if your life depends on it, it, it happens now. And we literally went through the whole house and just started looking at what's in our food. I mean, we knew and never did a really good job with our kids and um, all that stuff. But, you know, looking at the sugar content and stupid stuff like ketchup and, and literally everything in your house, it has high fructose, all this crap in it that is, is just crap. And uh, for me in my situation, it's very critical to to do that because um, it can really help. So I don't want it to feed. I don't want it to have energy. I don't want the cancer cells to be able to be fueled. So um, the diet has changed. I mean, I, I look this way, obviously, because of treatment and things like that. I'm down about 50 pounds, honestly. Um, but if if I didn't have the cancer and I'm on the diet I'm on now, I would look the exact same way. So um I feel fine. I look scrawny. That's why your show is called The Skinny. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's a play on but, word with two fat guys yeah. here, all right? Make it easy. <laughs> slid right in on that. But I don't know. It's just education, man. Just educate yourself. Take two seconds. The, the, the mainstream media won't give you a lot of it. I'm not Mr. Conspiracy Theory big time, but I do believe that there are massive alternative, alternative options. And all you have to do is just take the time to educate yourself and look it up. It's super easy. You'll learn a ton and and just talk. I mean, I've had people call me, you know, and I'll say, dude, I can't talk today because if you call, if we did the show last week, can you know? I was like, dude, I'm out. There's no way. Like, I can't even, I can't even sit here and have a conversation. Um, so, you know, on those weeks, that's when you just sit there and try to educate yourself and learn and, and talk to people and some people will call, try to call you like, hey, man, can we talk? I'm like, dude, not really. And they're like, all right, I'll just listen then. Um, so you just put the phone on speaker and, you know, give a yes or no here and there. But, um, yeah, just motivation, self-motivation, I think, fuels everything. I think that, to me, is the biggest cheat code um, that anybody would ever want. I mean, it's tough. People will get down. And I've had a lot of people tell me, dude, if you get down, just talk to me like I can help you. And I go, dude, you're, I appreciate that like a million percent, but you're, you're dealing with the wrong guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to let myself bury myself into a situation that I can get myself out of. Um, 
And it's a, it's a mental fight those days that suck. I really want to be here in the shop. I got a Pro 4 on a jig table below me that I would just love to sit here every day and just fab and wrench and work, but I can't. I physically cannot. Three days ago, I kid you not, mowing the lawn, I get off the tractor, start digging the ditch to clear up my motor track drain. I about passed out, dude. I was about gone. I, my white blood cells were gone. No energy. I drove the tractor back full zombie mode. My wife was so mad at me because she's like, dude, you need to slow down. These are the weeks where you need to stop. And I go, yeah, yeah, you're right. But I, I don't want to just let myself drag one week into the next and, and, and not be motivated on these two weeks. Well, I've got two weeks to be good. Let's, let's, let's just hang out on the couch and watch TV. Like as soon as I can physically get up and do something, she's like, where are you? <laughs> because I'm up, I'm at it. I'm either in the shop here tinkering, drawing stuff, learning, um, or sometimes I'm just out mowing lawns or, or trying to hang out with the kids. So just motivate yourself, motivate the people around you. And uh, positivity is, is massive. Want to get the skinny on other guests in different types of motorsports? Check out our YouTube page and get the skinny. The Skinny is brought to you by Fatheads Eyewear, Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04, and American Coach. American Coach, innovation is our life force. You're looking at an eight-time champ. That is Kyle Duke, and we're hoping he adds a lot more championships to the resume for sure. We've had him on the show here with us, the Skinny. Of course, we've touched on his racing career a bit. We've also touched on his current battle with head and neck cancer. He's filled us in on a lot of that information, really just touching on a little bit. But uh, more than anything, what I want to say to you, man, is you're such a source of inspiration to all of us. We hated that you're in this fight, but... Man, for somebody that's in the fight, you stay so positive. I told these guys before we had you on the show, I said, this isn't going to be a Debbie Downer show. It's just not who he is. He's a scrapper. He's a fighter. And, uh, and his head's in the right place. And I think the only way you have a shot at something like this is to have the attitude that you have. And that, that alone is quite a source of inspiration for everybody that's watching. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know that I would be for one, in this position, and two, be able to mentally be in this position. So um, I want to talk to you in, in, in a decade and and tell you about the journey since and how we've helped multiple, multiple people. Um, that's the story I want to tell. And, and if I, I have the avenue of racing to be able to do that. So um, that's going to be awesome to do, um, you know, to race for certain for causes, to do a lot of things. Um, and you don't really know about it until you're, you're in it, sadly. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I know it's, it's definitely, definitely going to be a roller coaster. I, I want it to go the way we all want it to go. Um, but, uh, that's going to take a lot more fighting and a lot more determination from everyone involved. My kids, wife, family, sponsors, everyone included. Hey, um, help us out here. For all of the folks that are watching here, if you want to get involved and support Kyle in this effort here, what's the website that they should go to? It is www.99duc, 99duc.com. Yeah, My of wife course. Built the, the, the store and everything, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's awesome, it, and it works perfectly. I mean, the stuff, that, the glass sitting on the desk, the shirt I'm wearing, uh, I had it within um, maybe three, four days. The By the way, yeah. One of my favorite shirts, I mean, not only is it supporting you, but I'm just talking about the way it wears and, and how it feels. It's an awesome it's an awesome shirt, so I promise you folks, you won't be disappointed. And then also, there's a way to make donations as well at Race Aid. USAC has a, uh, has a great format on their website called Race Aid, and you can go there and, and uh, type in a name for a specific person and make a donation there. It's tax deductible, so it's a, a couple of different ways we can help you out, man. Hey, uh, thanks for taking the time, dude. I know we had to, to select a certain week and a certain day here to get you on. Um, best of luck to you, my brother. We're, we all love you, man. We're all with you as best we can. But, uh, but you're the one that's going to be driving this truck here, and, uh, and we're, we're all behind you. We're your crew, man. Appreciate that, dude. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a long journey already, um, and we've got many, many years to go. So we... Uh, We'll keep fighting, dude. You'll, you, this will not be the last you've heard of us for sure. So appreciate you guys. 
for you even you know reaching out talking to me when when uh, you found out about all this and the knowledge for the USAC stuff, man, that's a cool place to do that. They've really helped out a ton and uh, made it super easy for us. So uh, hats off to them and the people that have all helped and, and, and done everything. So um, yes, thank you all very much. And thank you, Ken and, and uh, Rico, the, just the whole show. And yeah, it's been a good time, man. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle LaDuke.